A dental surveyor has been defined as an instrument used to determine the relative parallelism of two or more surfaces of the teeth or other parts of the cast of a dental arch. The principal parts of the surveyor are as follows. 1. Platform on which the base is moved. 2. Vertical arm that supports the superstructure. 3. Horizontal arm from which the mandrel suspends. 4. Table to which the cast is attached. 5. Base upon which the table swivels. 6. The mandrel is a vertical rod for holding special tools. 7. Analyzing rod and accessory tools. These tools contact the convex surface, to be studied in a tangential manner. The relative parallelism of one surface to another may thus be determined. By substituting a carbon marker, the height of contour may be delineated on the surfaces of the abutman teeth and also areas of interference requiring reduction or block out. The mandrel on the surveyor is retained by friction within a fixed bearing. The shaft may be moved up or down within this bearing, but remains in any vertical position until again moved. The shaft may be fixed in any vertical position desired by tightening a set screw. The surveyor may be used for surveying the diagnostic and master casts, simulated re-contouring abutment teeth, contouring wax patterns, measuring a specific depth of undercut, surveying ceramic veneer crowns, placing the intracoronal retainers, placing internal rests, and machining cast restorations. Surveying the diagnostic cast is essential to effective diagnosis and treatment planning. The objectives are as follows. 1. To determine the most acceptable path of placement, that will eliminate or minimize interference to placement and removal. The path of placement is the direction, in which a restoration moves from the point of initial contact of its rigid parts with the supporting teeth to the terminal resting position, with rest seated and the denture base in contact with the tissues. The path of removal is exactly the reverse since it is the direction of restoration movement from its terminal resting position of the last contact of its rigid parts with the supporting teeth. When the restoration is properly designed to have positive guiding planes, the patient may place and remove the restoration with ease in only one direction, because of the guiding influence of tooth surfaces made parallel to that path of placement. Two, to identify proximal tooth surfaces that are, or can be made parallel, so that they act as guiding planes during placement and removal. Three. To locate and measure areas of the teeth that may be used for retention. Four. To determine whether or not tooth and bony areas of interference will need to be eliminated either by extraction or by selecting a different path of placement. Five, to determine the most suitable path of placement that will permit locating retainers and artificial teeth to the best aesthetic advantage. Six, to permit an accurate charting of the mouth preparations to be made. This includes the disking of proximal tooth surfaces to provide guiding planes and the reduction of excessive tooth contours to eliminate interference and to permit a more acceptable location of reciprocal and retentive clasp arms. By marking these areas on the diagnostic cast with red pencil using an undercut gauge, to estimate the amount of tooth structure that may safely without exposing dentin be removed.
and then trimming the marked areas on the stone cast with a surveyor blade. The angulation and extent of tooth reduction may be established prior to preparing the teeth in the mouth. With a diagnostic cast on the surveyor at the time of mouth preparations, disking and reduction of tooth contours may thus be accomplished with acceptable accuracy. 7. To delineate the height of contour on abutment teeth, and to locate areas of undesirable tooth undercut that are to be avoided, eliminated, or blocked out. This will include areas of the teeth to be contacted by rigid connectors, the location of non-retentive reciprocal and stabilizing arms, and the location of retentive clasp terminals. Eight. To record the cast position in relation to the selected path of placement for future reference. This may be done by locating three dots or parallel lines on the cast, thus establishing the horizontal plane in relation to the vertical arm of the surveyor. 9. is the position of a cast on the surveyor table relative to the horizontal plane. Tilting is used to align guide planes. Relocates height of contour. Redistributes undercuts. Develops symmetrical embrasure spaces. Eliminates interferences. And facilitates usage of a preferred clasp. Although many potential paths of insertion exist, the position of zero tilt is to be preferred. 10. The factors that will determine the path of placement and removal are guiding planes, retentive areas, interference, and aesthetics. Guiding planes. Proximal tooth surfaces that bear a parallel relationship to one another must either be found or be created to act as guiding planes during placement and removal of the denture. Guiding planes may be compared to the valve guides in an engine and act to assure a definite path of placement as the rigid parts of the prosthesis contact parallel tooth surfaces. Guiding planes are necessary to assure the passages of the rigid parts of the prosthesis past existing areas of interference. Thus the denture can be easily placed and removed by the patient without strain on the teeth contacted, or on the denture itself and without damage to the underlying soft tissues. Guiding planes are also necessary to assure predictable clasp retention. For a clasp to be retentive, its retentive arm must be forced to flex. Hence, guiding planes are necessary to give a positive direction to the movement of the restoration to and from its terminal position. Retentive areas Retentive areas must exist for a given path of placement, which will be contacted by retentive clasp arms that will be forced to flex over a convex surface during placement and removal. Satisfactory clasp retention is no more than the resistance of metal to deformation. For a clasp to be retentive, its path of escapement must be other than parallel to the path of removal of the denture itself, otherwise, it would not be forced to flex and thereby generate the resistance known as retention. Clasp retention is therefore dependent on the existence of a definite path of placement and removal. Retention at each principal abutment does not necessarily have to be balanced in relation to the tooth on the opposite side of the arch, that is, exactly equal and opposite in magnitude and relative location. This is, of course, assuming that positive reciprocation to retentive elements is present, which must be cross-arch. Retention should be sufficient only to resist reasonable dislodging forces. In other words, it should be the minimum acceptable for adequate retention against reasonable dislodging forces. Fairly even retention may be obtained by one of two means. One is to change the path of placement, to increase or decrease the angle of cervical convergence, of opposing retentive surfaces of abutment teeth. The other is to alter the flexibility of the clasp arm by changing its design, its size and length and or the material of which it is made. Interference 
the prosthesis must be designed so that it may be placed and removed without encountering tooth or soft tissue interference. A path of placement may be selected that encounters interference only, if the interference can be eliminated during mouth preparations or on the master cast by means of a reasonable amount of block out. Interference may be eliminated during mouth preparations by surgery, extraction, disking of interfering tooth surfaces, or altering tooth contours with cast restorations. Generally, interference that cannot be eliminated for one reason or another will take precedence over the factors of retention and guiding planes. Sometimes certain areas can be made non-interfering only, by selecting a different path of placement at the expense of existing retentive areas and guiding planes. These must then be modified with restorations that are in harmony with the path dictated by the existing interference. On the other hand, if areas of interference can be eliminated by various reasonable means, they should be. By so doing, the contour of existing abutments may frequently be utilized with little or no alteration. One anterior teeth must be replaced with a partial denture. A vertical path of placement may be necessary to avoid excessively altering the adjacent abutment teeth and or the supplied teeth. Aesthetics also may dictate the choice of path selected when missing interior teeth must be replaced with a partial denture. In such situations a more vertical path of placement is necessary so that neither the artificial teeth nor the adjacent natural teeth will have to be modified excessively. In this instance aesthetics may take precedence over other factors. This necessitates the preparation of abutment teeth to eliminate interferences and to provide guiding planes and retention in harmony with that path of placement dictated by aesthetic factors. Aesthetics ordinarily should not be the primary factor in partial denture design. Therefore the replacement of missing anterior teeth should be accomplished by means of fixed restorations whenever possible, rather than permit their replacement, to influence the mechanical and functional effectiveness of the partial denture. Since the primary considerations should be the preservation of the remaining oral tissues, aesthetics should not be allowed to jeopardize the success of the partial denture. Attach the cast to the adjustable surveyor table by means of the clamp provided. Position the adjustable tables so that the occlusal surface of the teeth are approximately parallel to the platform. This is only a tentative, but practical, way to start considering the factors that influence the path of placement and removal. Guiding planes. Determine the relative parallelism of proximal tooth surfaces by contacting proximal tooth surfaces with the surveyor blade or diagnostic stylus. Alter the cast position anteroposteriorly until the proximal surfaces are in a parallel relation to one another or near enough that they can be made parallel by disking. This will determine the anteroposterior tilt of the cast in relation to the vertical arm of the surveyor. Although the surveyor table is universally adjustable, it should be thought of as having only two axes, thus allowing only anteroposterior and lateral tilting. By contacting buccal and lingual surfaces of abutment teeth with the surveyor blade, the amount of retention existing below their height of convexity may be determined. This is best accomplished by directing a small source of light toward the cast from the side away from the dentist. The angle of cervical convergence is best observed as a triangle of light between the surveyor blade and the tooth surface being studied. Alter the cast position by tilting it laterally until not grossly different retentive areas exist on the principal abutment teeth. In tilting the cast laterally to establish reasonable uniformity of retention, it is necessary that the table be rotated about an imaginary longitudinal axis without disturbing the anteroposterior tilt previously established. The resulting position is one that provides or makes possible parallel guiding planes and provides for acceptable retention on the abutment teeth. If a mandibular cast is being surveyed, check the lingual surfaces, 
that will be crossed by a lingual bar major connector during placement and removal. Bony prominences and lingually inclined premolar teeth are the most common causes of interference to a lingual bar connector. Interference to major connectors rarely exists in the maxillary arch. Areas of interference are usually found on buccally inclined posterior teeth and those bony areas on the buccal aspect of edentula spaces. As with the mandibular cast, the decision must be made whether to eliminate them, change the path of placement at the expense of guiding planes and retention, or design the connectors and bases to avoid them. The location of class arms for aesthetic reasons does not ordinarily justify altering the path of placement at the expense of mechanical factors. It should, however, be considered concurrently with other factors, and if a choice between two paths of equal merit permits, a more aesthetic placement of class arms by one path than the other, that path should be given preference. When anterior replacements are involved. The choice of path may be limited to a more vertical one. In this instance alone aesthetics must be given primary consideration even at the expense of altering the path of placement and making all other factors conform. This factor should be remembered when considering the other three factors, so that compromises can be made at the time other factors are being considered. The final path of placement will be the antero-posterior and lateral position of the cast in relation to the vertical arm of the surveyor that best satisfies all four factors, that is, guiding planes, retention, interference, and aesthetics. Replace the analyzing rod with a carbon marker. Mark the height of contour. Using the undercut gauge measure, and mark retentive areas in red. Mark areas requiring mouth preparation. Some method of recording the relation of the cast to the vertical arm of the surveyor must be used, so that it may be returned to the surveyor for future reference. One method is to place three widely divergent dots on the tissue surface of the cast with the tip the carbon marker, having the vertical arm of the surveyor in the locked position. Preferably these dots should not be placed on areas of the cast involved in the framework design. Then the dots should be encircled with a colored pencil for easy identification. A second method is to score or mark two sides and the dorsal aspect of the base of the cast with a sharp instrument held against the surveyor blade. By tilting the cast until all three lines are again parallel to the surveyor blade, the original cast position can be re-established. Fortunately, the scratch lines will be reproduced in any duplication, thereby permitting any duplicate cast to be related to the surveyor in a similar manner. The master cast must be surveyed as a new cast, but the prepared proximal guiding plane surfaces will indicate the correct antero-posterior tilt. Some compromises may be necessary but the amount of guiding plane surface remaining after blockout should be the maximum for each tooth. Areas above the point of contact with the surveyor blade are not considered to be part of the guiding plane area, and neither are gingival undercut areas, which will be blocked out. The lateral tilt will be the position that provides equal retentive areas on all principal abutments in relation to the planned clasp design. Gross interference will have been eliminated during mouth preparation. Thus, for a given path a placement providing guiding planes and balanced retention, any remaining interference must be eliminated with block out. If mouth preparations have been adequately planned and executed, the undercuts remaining to be blocked out should be minimal. 